Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed your quick break. I would like to introduce our speakers. We'll start with our moderator, Mr. Christian Kuntz, Director, Business Development at DIFC. On the panel, we have Mr. Jamil Khan, Head of Digital and Innovation at Mashrek Bank. Mr. Andreas Anelaksas, Client Relationship Director at Anglo Gulf Trade Bank. And joining us virtually, we have Ms. Sri Lakshmi, Head of Analytics and AI, as well as Mr. Ferdinando Samaria, Independent Technology Advisor. Welcome everyone, and over to you, Christian. Perfect, thank you. Just small uh, correction, my role is the head of group strategy and innovation. Um, Sorry. <laughs> but we had our director of business development as well here, but great to be here today. Welcome to the, uh, the panel members. I'm very excited. Uh, it's a very um, diverse and uh, uh, a very um, experienced panel. And I'm glad to be here in this hybrid setting. So we have some colleagues from, from, the, from the UK and we have obviously here our audience uh, today in, in, uh, in the DFC Innovation Hub. The topic is AI opportunities in banking. Um, we're gonna cover like three main topics. I think we're gonna start off with talking about the return on investment uh, and questions around how do, you, how do you look at return on investment in specifically in AI projects? Um, how do you, you know, measure this? How do you convince the decision makers and, and how do you actually uh, get to impact? Um, and uh, in that context, I'll start off with Andres uh, from uh, Anglo Gulf Trade Bank. I'd like to hear kind of your view on how, how did you, or how does your organization look at ROI in the context of AI in banking specifically? Thank you, Christian. I think, you know, AGTB is still a brand new digital bank created essentially from scratch. Uh, so we don't have particular uh, AI strategy on how we approach it. But the way we look at this is as in any other technology related investment, we really look at uh, you know, problem statements that you potentially face either on the front end or on the back end of our uh, operations. And then we you know, see what are solutions out there. And um, let's say if, if, uh, if you wanna improve the client experience, then we you know, potentially look at what uh, NLP or robotic type of solutions we can apply actually. Uh, to improve that. And then at the end, of course, is the, you know, what value we can bring and what savings, uh, you know, what's the bottom line uh, impact that we can get. So for us uh, in our bank, I think at this moment is just as any other technology investment, really evaluating just, you know, <laughs> what value it will bring okay. at the end of the day as any other technology. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, pull in one of our virtual um, um, panelists, uh, Dr. Ferdinando. Um, how do you how do you um, look at ROI in um, in the context of AI opportunities in banking in in and maybe in the uh, in your experience previously um, uh, with UniCredit or with other kind of clients that you work with? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I hope you can hear me. You can hear me okay. Um, over time, we built many uh, systems based on advanced technologies within organizations, and the attraction of that is quite, is quite obvious. Often you have a cost dimension, which can be uh, relatively easily quantified, as well as increased revenues where this is relevant. However, I think what is very important to uh, evaluate when dealing with innovative uh, processes uh, like um, introducing major technologies into complex organizations, I would say there are two aspects that are key. The first one is assessing the impact of legacy systems. AI, uh, very often you get shown demos, sandbox uh, examples, uh, but in the end, whatever system you bring into the organization has to interface to that organization to work properly. And very often you will find that a lot of the costs are actually going to be not around the new technology per se, but actually in the interfaces to legacy systems. The other thing that I would always be very vigilant about is how future-proof some of the things that you invest in are going to be. I think it would be very disappointing to face you know, substantial implementation costs and then discover that some of the technologies that you brought into the organization are not suitable for imminent future developments. So the idea that, for example, 
you know, you may have innovation in cryptography, you may have innovation in machine learning, methodologies linked to federated learning, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. If your new system is not able to cope with some of these uh, developments, then you risk having to start again from scratch, clearly having an impact on the value of your of your investment. So two things, clearly evaluate the cost of interfacing to existing legacy systems. And the second thing, make sure that whatever new major technological investment you make is as future proof as you can get it. Excellent. Thank you very much for, for these very interesting insights. Sri, uh, um, from, uh, from your point of view and from your experience at, at First Abu Dhabi Bank, do you share the, the, the view of the, the previous panelists? Do you look at it differently? What type of metrics do you look at in context of such innovative projects? Uh, for us, uh, I think uh, the, the roadmap for ROI calculation is pretty simple. While uh, my peer Fernando really uh, very beautifully explained the ROI aspect of looking at the systems, technology, and way to operationalize your models that you do during the POC. The other aspect of it is if clearly the implementations that you're planning to do doesn't take one of the boxes of whether it would drive a revenue impact for you or would it drive a customer experience or would it bring in any process reengineering thus driving a cost optimization? I think if it doesn't take one of these boxes, there is a really need to think about is there a value in doing that such kind of an implementation? Uh, not only for AI, but for any implementations or initiatives that you want to do in your organization, ROI kinds of drives a discipline in terms of you really thinking whether what you're attempting to do, uh, what kind of value it brings in, and who all needs to be involved in doing and achieving that. Jamil, um, from, from the Mushrek Bank's point of view, anything to add in, in, in how you look at ROI? So I'll I'll try and add a bit of color from a use case perspective, perhaps. So, um, so our journey around uh, AI enhanced robotics, for example, started in 2017 with a significant back office transformation. And um, so a couple of use cases there, um, uh, one around check processing. So a very manual kind of uh, shop to start with, particularly around signature verification. But by using machine vision, you were able to, you know, there are 26 validations on a given check, including signature. And when it comes to signature verification, the algo doesn't cross-reference against the specimen signature, but the evolutionary pattern of that customer signature, because we know our signatures move over time. So, so that's been a significant cost save. Uh, another one's around payments queries, right? So so when a, when a payments investigation request comes from another bank, it usually lands with an investigations team who pick it up. It's a plain English request. They go and do some analysis, write a response, send it back. So we were able to put in a solution that picks up that request, understands it through NLP, goes and finds the appropriate data, typically when the instruction was received, when it was processed, structure a response in plain English and send it back. So in both of those areas, you know, you've had a significant uplift in terms of cost reduction, uh, as well as throughput, because it's machines doing it much faster. And a tertiary benefit has been a forensic audit trail that you can create for every step of that process, because it's a, it's a machine recording its actions. Um, and then when we, we kind of more recently moved to the cloud and the sponsor moved from the operation side of the business to the front office, the, the needle has turned towards revenue growth. And so a couple of the use cases there are, are around uh, client potential, for example. So, so this is where we're using machine learning to, to look at our universe of clients and put them into similar clusters. And so the hypothesis is that if you have eight out of 10 similar clients using a letter of guarantee, for example, there's a, a reasonable probability that the two out of 10 could also use that service from you. And uh, another one uh, around 
point of sales terminals. So the where we use a card to pay for our goods and services. So what we were able to do is to monitor payment flows from those POS terminals and see you know, how much of that post-transaction flow we were able to service or we were servicing. Um, and through machine learning again, kind of identify new client relationships and deepen other client relationships. So that's effectively, you know, kind of helped us discover relationships that we didn't know we could potentially have uh, and has helped, you know, kind of move the needle on revenue growth. How important uh, and uh, very impressive. So thanks for sharing these insights. How, how important was this first use case, this first, you know, proof of concept that, you know, you can, you can get some, and that was a cost use case, like you can get benefits of this to then accelerate the, the other use cases? So, so it's a great question because there's a degree of kind of leaping into the unknown, right? But, but I think like with most speculative ventures to start with, it's a partnership with the, with the vendor that you're working with. And so you start with a proof of concept. Um, you have to have an open mind that these are learning processes. The bots themselves also learn um, and through a very kind of close monitoring of the implementation and the constant feedback loop, you kind of see, are you, are you kind of making the right steps? Do you have to course correct? Um, and eventually, you know, I think the, the concept pays for itself for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Andrush, in your case, like what were the, I know you've done, a, I think a PUC with, with Tiger. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, you're a digital bank by, 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 by nature. What were the discussion points where you need to spend most time with management and, and how do you approach them in this, in this context? Right. I think one of the key things was that, as we know, AI projects tend to be capital intensive. You know? And for us as a small organization, our client volumes, our onboarding uh, kind of volumes are not that high. You know? So for the kind of ROI discussion, it was very hard to base it on the current flows, you know? So the discussion was focused on our kind of long-term strategy, where we want to be as a bank, and um, do we want to continue with the current setup or do we want to create an organization that then scale? And, you know, so that was one of the discussion points about, uh, you know, kind of future state versus today state. And then, you know, do we invest now into, into the system? Um, and secondly, was also on the actual readiness of the system, you know, because uh, let's say to train the NLP or calibrate the NLP engine, you need a certain amount of data, you know, in hundreds, if not thousands. Let's say if you want to train the NLP to read the board resolution, you need uh, hundreds, if not thousands of examples of different board resolutions, you know, so that you can achieve 90 plus percent accuracy. So for us, as, as we just started, you know, we, Again, there was a yeah. discussion, are we ready or do we need to wait maybe a year or two and then start these projects? So those two points were actually quite... What, was the, what was the scope of the POC, if you can talk about oh, it? Oh, definitely. So we worked with um, uh, Tiger. Uh, we as a bank actually identified corporate client onboarding as our primary kind of differentiating point in the market because the retail client onboarding is already quite digital. It's smooth. While corporate onboarding, especially in this region, tends to be quite uh, complex because you have, you know, uh, a lot more documents, you have ownership structures, you have uh, different users with their, you know, payment authorization frameworks and everything. So we really try to optimize that process. And usually the way it works is that the client submits certain information and at the end of the journey, they upload the documents. Mm -hmm. We in a way inversed that flow through the Tiger solution. We allowed to kind of do the bulk upload we envision to do the bulk upload of the documents, whether, you know, it categorizes, you know, what kind of document that is, whether it's uh, articles of association or board resolution or, you know, just basic trade license. And then it reads uh, that information. So if it's a basic OCR solution it can, in, a, in a structured document, it can read, you know, trade license. But the key value add from the, you know, Tiger solution and NLP that they provided was reading those unstructured documents, you know like board resolution or uh, proof of ownership documents that can be from one page to five pages. So we read those documents, we extracted that data, and then we pre-filled the journey, the onboarding journey, different fields of our digital onboarding journey with that information. So clients, instead of going, you know, window by window, filling it up, they already had 
up to you know 50 or plus percent of information already filled from those documents that they already uploaded. So we estimated from the, our POC that we run is up to 40% of time saved actually uh, on the client side. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ferdinando, um, can you elaborate on, on some of the concrete use cases that, that you worked on that were uh, in, in the banking context that were sort of the most uh, uh, impressive ones? Um, thanks for the question. We, um, the largest uh, project that we implemented was a system for automatically managing a very large portfolio of uh, capital guaranteed financial products. We had approximately seven to 800 different product lines uh, for a total volume of in excess of about 20 billion euros. Um, and the system was automatically monitoring the um, the value of all uh, of all the portfolio lines uh, in reference to the various guarantees that uh, were promised to the customer. So there was constant rebalancing of the portfolio. Uh, there was constant revaluation of obviously all the assets as well as calibration to market volatilities. And then depending on the um, sense that the system got from the market, uh, trading signals were issued and um, implemented in terms of uh, re rebalancing of the investment strategy. So you can see it as a sort of a robot advisor that looks at complex uh, security portfolios with specific revenue targets, revenue in the sense of uh, return targets, sorry for the client, uh, and then adapts the investment strategy around, uh, around both those uh, targets and uh, signals coming from, from the market. There was an element of learning of market trends by handling um, uh, market data. But the impressive thing is that whereas in the past, you would have had different analysts, different money managers and different risk managers, all dealing with the various parts of the portfolio analysis, suddenly you have a central machine that automatically monitors the portfolio, writes emails, uh, pre prepares uh, confirmations, and ships them to the rest of the organization seamlessly and automatically. So in a way, the project was particularly successful because then when you look at the return on the activity, the cost dimension in the equation is extremely slim whereas the revenues remain pretty much the ones that we had projected. Now, instead of having to invest a large number of resources to manage the process, suddenly you have a system that does it for you. The other advantage, of course, is that you have constant, complete audit trail. Because the system is digital, every action, every rebalancing, every trading signal, everything is recorded so that if you ever have the need from a compliance or a customer service point of view to go back and revisit what happened, you have a full record. I mean, these are relatively obvious things that when you deal with digital systems, you have virtually for free as a byproduct. But as I said earlier, in the context of existing incumbent players with large legacy systems, very often there is a sense of marvel that all of this can work automatically because people are used to a lot of manual activities inside banking organizations. And I think it's refreshing to experience situations where a lot of the good, obvious benefits of technology can be enjoyed both in terms of cost management and indeed satisfaction for customers. Uh, very impressive. When you, before you got this project approved, what were the discussions like it seemed like it's a from the way you described it now looking backward it seemed like a you know a very obvious one but what were the discussions among uh, management and 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 the points that you needed to get give comfort um to actually go ahead that, that's a brilliant question christian because uh and it's probably the part that i enjoyed the most in the process let me be clear so my background is in technology I'm an investment banker, but I write my own code. I can write programs and I can, I can design systems. So I'm very hands-on. And in organizations, you need to have people who ultimately, if necessary, are able to do implementation. So if I go back to the project that I just mentioned, 
in the end, it boils down to literally three or four extremely highly skilled programmers with very good understanding of finance as well, who take the responsibility of building a system. That is often the most difficult thing at a management level to, 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 to basically um, uh, to, to get approved because people are a bit skeptical that you may be able to deliver complex solutions like that. But in reality, technology in many ways is, is especially if things are very well laid out in terms of architecture, is a great simplifier. So in the end, if you manage to work with people who believe in the skill set of the employees involved and you get the green light to go ahead and implement solutions, uh, then that uh, obviously is, 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 is the thing that will eventually lead to success. Now, you can have two different routes. You can have internalization or you can have collaboration with external partners. Obviously, both are valid. Clearly, if you're going the internal route, selection of personnel is the single most important factor. If you're going the external route, selection of partners is the most important factor. This is ultimately a, a human resource issue either way. Uh, and your result is going to be as good as the people who are involved working on the project. So uh, I think spending perhaps a bit more time selecting the right people is something that will bring benefits over and over again over time. Thank you. Uh, Sri, uh, maybe uh, moving, uh, moving over to you. What, uh, what was the most, uh, you know, the most successful use case that, uh, that you worked on? Um, and again, similar question, like how, how did you get uh, to convince management to, to go ahead with it looking backwards? I'll answer that question by picking one point from what Fernando just said is, you know, when you have people technically uh, with that technical background uh, and they know how to do it. Example, I am also a technical person, can write codes at a time. But how does this differ from people who are not from such background is it becomes very easy to convince your management because then you will be seamlessly able to answer all the questions they ask during the business case discussions or ROI discussions. It also gives you to challenge either your internal route of you working with a, a group of skilled individuals or you going with an external partners. There are ample number of uh, very capable external partners today who can bring you a lot of value. But what do you want to pick from them? Where do you want to use them? Becomes very easy if there are people at a middle management level who are from that uh, technical background. So I, I completely agree with him on that point. And that is a very uh, critical point to have a successful AI engagements in the organization. Coming to the second part of the question. Uh, okay, now uh, I'll refer to one of uh, the uh, very creative initiatives uh, that uh, I'm planning to work on, or rather I'm doing some kind of uh, R&D at my level, is building a knowledge repository to uh, um, solve the after sales call, yeah, where you have an automated bot helping your sales agents to look at your uh, set of uh, regulatory rules, your set of business rules that you have to tell to your customer when you are pitching a product. There are at times that you have your rules book written on your desk and you're just reading it from, okay, look, the interest rate is 3.2, you have to pay in 12 months, but what if there is a strategy and you haven't updated your number on your hard copy paper that you're referring to, or these documents that you're referring to while doing the sales are not updated with your latest uh, strategy change in the organization. So such virtual bot would do use a voice technology, transcribe what the agent is saying and thus compare with the internal data and tell you, look, you missed to tell that your payment period is revised from 12 to 18 months and it is not 3.2, but it is 3.32, yeah? So a automated probing to help agents uh, do a successful sales call and this will also help to solve any disputed sales uh, after sales call. So this is one of um, a very interesting use case that we are currently looking at. And a lot of voice technologies uh, use cases that we have worked on are uh, very successful and are driving a good amount of customer experience. Excellent, thank and you very much. And if you ask me uh, this question of what was my difficulty in explaining this or convincing my management, 
I would tell you this, I think most of the ex-co members today or people who sit in the board to approve your use cases are using AI in some way or the other in their daily lives. They are using an Alexa at home. They are using Siri on their mobiles. So it's, it's easy to explain, uh, you know, how, what these technologies can drive. For me, the most difficult question is to answer, okay, when will this be done? Yeah, <laughs> when will you deploy or when will you operationalize? So that's, uh, I know it is difficult to convince, but not so much given that people have adopted and understood what AI can bring into the organizations, especially in banking. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, just doing a time check. Yes, so we apparently have several questions for you. Um, oh yeah, why don't we take uh, yeah. the first questions? Yeah. Absolutely. So if we can get the pigeonhole, please. Sure. Excellent. Okay, so first question, can you elaborate how do you perform ROI on an AI solution that is not easy to select, not clear what the outcome will be, as it is still work in progress, and when will the result be useful time-wise? Anyone would like to answer this one? I would, I would take that question. See, okay. uh, the question says, uh, how do you perform an ROI on an AI solution that not easy to select? Uh, this is quite a, a bit of ambiguous question because when we are trying to do a POC, let's, let's say that you do not have an implementation finalized yet, but you really need to know what is that going, going to achieve? Okay, let's say if you are doing a voice technology or if you're going to do a virtual board or a voice biometric, Yes, you are trying to implement and experiment with voice biometric, but you need to know how it is going to be used in the organization that you are working at. Though you might not know all the advantages, you might not know a, a dollar value it might end up saving, but intangible benefits at that point in time should be clear, which then becomes a driving factor for somebody to say, okay, for you to go ahead and do that experiment or say, okay, to your POC. So if you do not have tangible inputs ready, at least a high level intangible advantages of doing such POC should be clear, which basically helps in uh, a board member saying, okay, for your experiment. That's my take on the question. Okay, Mr. Gekin, does that answer your question? Let's hope it does. All right, second question. Delivery and support costs directly affect the return on investment calculations. Are you building deep internal skills to support your projects or are you relying on your SI tech partners? Who would like to take this one? Um, I'll, I'll have a go. So, um, so I think for us, it started with very much a partner driven model um, where the, the whole area was new to us. So we wanted to, to effectively take steps around stewardship, expertise being brought into the bank. As time has evolved, as our experience has evolved, we've pivoted to a, a much more in-house model. So, so now, you know, we have a, a head of advanced analytics um, that's driving data strategy, that's driving in-house development. We've moved to uh, a platform that's linked to our cloud platform uh, around building in-house models. So I think it's a maturity curve that, that the most firms go through ultimately. Would anyone like to add anything? I think You're I just want to add one point in here where yes, I completely sir. agree with what Jamil said. Uh, to have a very lean team, to start off when you're doing such kind of initiatives is very important because you need to have your knowledge of your implementations in-house to stay, though you are heavily partnering with your external members. So just a one or two members to start off with where they are trying to see, review, read, understand the solution, the designs of what the external partners are bringing in so that you know certain level of knowledge enhancement stays with the team and it grows as the maturity curves grows on. Thank you. Third question, given it is not easy to predict how long it takes to build the data set and calibrate the AI for adequate and unbiased output, how do you model the ROI analysis? Can I try to, to take this if that's okay? Um, yes, Dr. Samaria. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think this really goes back again to the question question that was asked at the beginning. And there is a general issue of how do you benchmark AI 
applications. Now, I operate in the fintech uh, environment here in London, and I very often have to advise investors who actually ask me exactly the same question about startups that are putting forward uh, AI innovation. How does an investor assess the potential returns that an uncertain technology, and often unproven as well, uh, promises to bring? I think this is a very interesting uh, question. Uh, and it is one that um, um, you know, requires quite a lot of uh, deep understanding of the way, especially some of the algorithms work. In order for you to be able to make an assessment, I'm afraid you do need to understand how some of the proposed technologies work, have an idea of probably a probability distribution of success of those activities, so that you can then convert that into potential impact on your cost dimension, on your revenue dimension, and obviously because we're talking about financial institutions, very often also on your capital dimension. I think by then bringing together the impact that your new projects can have on all these three elements combined, uh, then you will be in a better position to, uh, to make those assessments. But the question is, is, is legitimate and to a certain extent, it does remain a slightly open question in the sense that you're not looking at traditional project analysis where you have consolidated performance observed in other situations that you can translate to your, to your project. You do have to uh, take a, you know, a certain amount of um, entrepreneurial risk when selecting some of these solutions because the exact way in which they're going to interact with your specific problem may turn out to be slightly different than perhaps envisaged when the proposal was abstract and still not sufficiently applied. Thank you, doctor. And the last question, what is the main challenge you think we have in adopting AI solutions in the banking industries of the Middle East? As per my little knowledge, I found people objecting cloud environment still. Yes, I can answer this one. So for us, uh, for us as a bank, it was not a challenge because our, you know, AGTB full architectural stack is built on cloud. But from my previous manage, uh, kind of consulting uh, engagements, yes, I know that uh, a lot of banks are still on-prem and then a lot of AI solutions are actually cloud-based. So you have to make sure that, you know, it's, it's aligned. But one very specific Middle Eastern um, challenge is the Arabic language. Because when we worked uh, with the document, uh, you know, OCR solutions and specifically NLP, we realized that actually Arabic language, it's very hard to calibrate the NLP engine for the Arabic language. So actually we just stayed with the English to begin with. So that's- That's know, a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. I, I, I just want to add to that. I mean, I think there's also not so much a technology challenge, but also um, a culture fit, right? Around um, if we take this uh, client potential model that I was talking about earlier, and, and you're, you're effectively giving machine generated leads to sales staff who've, who've spent their entire life finding and organically kind of cultivating leads. So you have to spend a lot of time working closely with them around, around the, the idea that this is a viable lead that's worth investing your time in, right? And, right. and using that conversation to, to refine the model and build the capability of the model itself. Mm -hmm. So I think it, there's, there's a strong cultural aspect to building adoption of AI in as much as some of these technology constraints that we have as well. I, see. I have one last yes. question for the panelists, yes, if you allow me. I think so. Um, thanks. So it was very interesting. I learned a lot myself. Um, and I think uh, you're spot on. I think talent, also like the you know, linking technology and, and, and people and the culture, I think is quite important. But the one question I'd like to ask each of the panelists, like what is it in your, in your experience, in, in your opinion, that banks and FIs can unlock better with their AI today? I personally think it's data. I think we're just scratching the surface on uh, capabilities that uh, AI can provide leveraging the data. I mean, there's a lot of fundamental activities needs to be done in the banking sector to really consolidate all the data that sits in different silences. But once it's done, I think there's a lot of things could be done both from the, you know, different 
payment pattern recognition to compliance to uh, just proactive offerings, you know, where you, based on client activity patterns, can provide different pricing, different products, and tailored for that specific personalized moment. Excellent. Data, Jamil? So, I, if, if I can be so bold, I'll take a bit of a, bit of a philosophical answer on this, right? So, go ahead. So, I think, I think banks can help unlock better societies with AI. Um, and I'll use the, the example of Ant Financial, the, the huge uh, Chinese uh, financial service provider. And there, they use their knowledge graph um, and the Alibaba uh, product catalog to help Shanghai residents. So Shanghai latter half of 2019 came out with very stringent waste sorting requirements for its citizens. Uh, between wet, dry, hazardous, and recyclable, right? So Ant Financial, within two weeks, put together an app around helping customers to sort with a, through machine vision, sort their rubbish as to which, which bucket it belonged in. And if it was a re recyclable, you know, with one click, arrange the collection of that through the Alibaba courier service. And also each time they use the app, getting charity points for that. So Alibaba uh, and Financial, a financial organization, deploying its AI capability to solve a municipality problem and address UN sustainability goals. You know, I think that's where this Amazing. kind of opportunity lies around social change and, and looking for where capability and technology exists and, and, and finding adjacent paths for making improvements. Great. So data, social, I think ESG general is a, is a big topic yep. as well. Uh, Sri, what's, what's your uh, view? I think for me, uh, with AI, you would be able to know what you don't know. Because with the hidden insights, with turning off these insights, you will start knowing your unknown behaviors of either your customer, your business, your products to know. So you will start knowing what you don't know. And for things that you already know, you will know more. You will know those hidden patterns and those anomalies which you were not aware of. So the more you start uh, adopting to these technologies, you will start becoming more knowledgeable and more knowingly knowing what you know and what you don't know. Might be that sounded like a puzzle, but yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, lastly, Dr. Ferdinando. I see a migration towards a digital asset definition. If you look at the major banks in the world and you take the simplest, the most humble financial instrument like a share or a stock, every one of those institutions has at least 20 different systems with 20 different definitions of the very simple and humble share. There will be one data model in risk, one data model in accounting, one data model in compliance, one different data model in front office trading. This is not uh, conceivable. I think in the modern setup, you want a unique digital asset definition. When you achieve that, then advanced technologies like artificial intelligence will be really able to open up the full potential and produce the best possible benefits to users because suddenly they will be operating on a uniform structured, clean environment where the focus can be just the strength and potency of the algorithm and not just running around like a headless chicken trying to collect data and making sure that that data is correct. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you all um, for this wonderful panel. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Kunz, thank for you. moderating this panel. Pleasure. Mr. Andrush, Mr. Khan, Ms. Lashmi, you're in Abu Dhabi? In Dubai. Yes. Oh, you are in Dubai right now. Okay, okay. But you were with First Abu Dhabi Bank. I got misled. And Dr. Samaria, thank you very much for joining us. Where are you calling from today? I'm in, uh, I'm in London. And uh, uh, today the weather is bad because people are talking <laughs> about possibly reopening from lockdown. So basically, when the lockdown was on, the weather was fantastic. Every time <laughs> anybody hints at the fact that we might unlock, then it starts raining. Oh, crossing fingers. Thank you very much for joining us today.